right, Shalom, Shalom. First and foremost, giving all praise, glory, and honor be to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rakak, Wadash. Double honors to the apostles and elders of Great Millstone, better known as GMS, who were well. Peace and salutations unto the hopeful elect, the tabernacle of David, beginning with the 144,000 and the rest of the men, women, and children, whom Yahweh Bashmel Shah will have mercy upon out of the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm your brother, Mati Zakbath. And today's lesson is going to be dealing with uh, King James and the controversy surrounded by King James. I've been wanting to do this for quite some time because um, a lot of the times you get, you know, people that come into the truth and they try to um, they try to debate that King James was a mole. And you should know what I mean by when I say he was a mole and um, also that. um. With him writing the book of uh, de uh, demonology, that he was into uh, necromancy, witchcraft, enchantments, and stuff like that. So what you're going to see in this lesson that I'm dealing with um, is that all of those accusations brought out against him. All right. Um, number one, people don't do their due diligent research, and number two, they don't actually know that a lot of that stuff came out after the fact of when he passed away and he couldn't defend himself. Now, also, you have to keep in mind going back around his time, around the 1600s, all right, when he was ruling, um, what you have to understand is the way that the people were back then, all right, obviously, they're nothing like the way that everybody is today in the world. And the standard around his kingdom was he predicated his kingdom based off what was written in the scriptures. He truly was a man of the most high. Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai. In other words, um, when he, even when he published the, um, the author, well, let me say it like this so you don't get confused. When he authorized the King James Bible 1611, which we know today, those works started in 1604, but it wasn't until the authorization of it was sealed and finalized and ready to be published in 1611. A lot of people don't even know that history. So what you have to understand is that because a lot of people will say he wrote the Bible, he did not write it. The issue that was going on back during the time when he was uh, king was the fact that the only Bible that was public or that was viewable to the public was a Bible that didn't or not even that. Let's go a little bit further so you guys can understand the Christian church or the so-called church. Um, I think it was either the Church of England or the uh, the Catholic Church. Um, I have to go back and read my notes. But basically, the during that time, the uh, the priest, all right, the pope and stuff, the, the, the uh, people who who had a high chiefly sort of order within a church they was the only ones that were allowed to read the scriptures to the public you couldn't have a copy of the bible they didn't the church at that time they didn't want people reading the scriptures so what happened was when king james came into power and he started analyze analyzing the situation and what was going on um within the society he wanted to change that he felt that the people had a right to know that everybody should be able to have a Bible within their own household because during that time, um, the church, they didn't allow it. So if you wanted to know like some deep, dark parables, if you wanted to know breakdowns or whatever, you actually had to go to the church. You couldn't just like what we're doing now, how, you know, we come out on the highways and hedges. We do sit down lessons like I'm doing and we're telling you, we're giving you the history of breakdowns. You couldn't do that back then. And see, a lot of people don't understand that because they don't read. They don't do their research. You know, you couldn't do that back then. So what King James did was he came and he analyzed what was going on and he disagreed with that. So he started coming in and he started changing everything. And he felt that the people had a right to have a copy of the scriptures within their own household. Now, before he authorized his version you have what was called the Geneva Bible. And I forget, I believe the, the problem with the Geneva Bible was it had a lot of stuff in it. One, 
stuff that were contradictory to the scriptures and it was something else. I can't remember. It's been a while since I touched on this, so please forgive me. But um, basically, um, make a long story short, he ended up authorized for a new addition to the scriptures um, to be read in, in its entirety, to be completely translated directly from the uh, Hebrew scrolls and from the Greek Septuagint. So he was the, the first king to come in and to analyze everything and to bring all 80 books together. That's another thing that people don't know, because if you own a King James Bible today, just a regular standard King James Bible, you will only have 66 books. There's actually a total of 80 books. All right. And the 80 books is a combination of both the Old Testament, the Apocrypha, which is 14 books on its own and the New Testament. So when people say, what Bible are you reading? Why do you read the King James? Why do you read the King James? Because when, when he authorized it, he had the best top tier scholars at that time to um, bring everything together and to very diligently and carefully translate it. Now, although some of those scholars, they have mistranslated certain words because you have to understand during that time in the way that the English language was at that time, they had to choose certain words that best describes the English language at that time. That's the reason now any anything between 1800s and moving forward all the way up until this day, you have something that's called revision. All right. To revise something means you go over again, you analyze it and then you republish it. And that's that's what's happened. That's the reason why when you read new translations like the NLT or the NIV or uh, the ASV, the GNT, you, you cannot read it verbatim. And the issue that a lot of people make with these different translations of the scriptures is the fact that they go to read them and then they take them at face value. This is the importance as to why you need a concordance, because you have to go back to the actual, um, you know, script to where it originally was translated from, which is the Hebrew scrolls and the Greek Septuagint and also the Latin Vulgate. You know, to give an example, the beloved brother Yoramia yesterday went over with um, a gentleman who came on a comic board and uh, he brought out a precept dealing with the word religion all right <clears throat> and i believe he got the precept in the book of james where it talks about um you know if any man's religion uh roughly paraphrasing you know um but just to hit the nail on the coffin you see the word religion and you think that it's literally talking about religion it's not really talking about religion all right because when you go into that word really it's talking about worshiping yahweh shai OK, this book, this this ministry of ours is not a religion. All right. It is a, a heritage. All right. That consists of law, statutes and commandments. OK, religion really is man made. OK, which goes back to the Latin Latin word uh, religia, which let me pull that up real quick. I guess we'll start off with that. So that you brothers and sisters can get the correct understanding. Now, I'm going to read it from the. Um, etymology online, but I'm going to show you where they go off. And I'm also going to show you how um, they will try to control the narrative by telling you what the what their definition of religion is. But in the same context, they'll give you the truth of what it is. And this is why when people read it, they get confused, they get bugged out. So um, now let's stay here. This is this is from the etymology Online, it says religion, 1200 century, the state of life bound by uh, monastic vows, also action or conduct indicating a belief in a divine power and reverence for and desire to please it. Now, that's their version. That's the narrative that they put out. That's the definition that they give you. Right now. When you drop down, let's continue to read. It says from the Anglo-French religion, uh, piety, devotion, religious community, and directly from Latin religionum or uh, religio, which means respect for what is sacred, reverence for the gods, consciousness, sense of right, moral obligation, fear of the gods, 
divine service, religious observance, a religion, a faith, a mode of worship. Right now, when you go into it, um, it drops down. It says this noun of action was derived from Cicero from Relegora to go through again, read again, Legora read. That's basically what it means. It means to read again. All right. But in the, but now let's pull out the scripture so you can get a better understanding. When you break the word down, let's go to the book of James. And I believe if I'm not mistaken, what is it? James three or James four. Let me see. Salakia, just bear with me. Just look it up. I think it's the book of James. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah, James one. So this is the book of James, chapter one. And uh, I'm going to start at verse 26. It says, if any man among you seem to be religious and brittleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is in vain. Now, when you go into that word in the Greek. Which let's pull this up real quick. You have the Greek word threskos, which ultimately it actually simply means fearing or worshiping the most high. Yahweh Bashim Yahweh that's really all it means. It says in the Strong's definitions, a ceremonious, a ceremonious in worship as demonstrative, right? So basically, to demonstrate something is to give it an account of what was set before you and to act it out. Just like what we're doing in these last days, we are rehearsing the righteous acts pertaining to uh, Judges 5 and 11. All right. We're worshiping Yahweh Bashim Yahweh in spirit and in truth. So predicated off the Greek word threskos, which goes back to the English translation of being religion, that would be your true religion, worshiping Yahweh Bashim Yahweh through what he told us to do. Not in, a, and not in the uh, lens of what Esau Edom has given us being of a man-made doctrine. Religion was taken out of way out of context going back to the uh roman catholic church uh so much so it really came a what's the word i'm looking for just i'm trying to make this make sense so let's say the hell doctrine they used the hell doctrine to put fear into the minds of the people to basically get them to do what they want them to do and so anytime that's why when you say the word religion especially in 2024 it's become so loosely, uh, you know, translated or whatever. Um, so much so that people, as soon as they say religion, the first they think of, oh, it's something man-made. It's to scare you, whatever the case may be. They don't really understand the etymology of what the word really means. You know? So anytime somebody comes up on us, oh, you, you're just trying to impose your your religion on us stuff. We're not opposing anything. We are worried about our nation of people. Okay. We're worried about the elect of our people. This is a heritage. This is not a religion. Point blank period. You know? So I just want to speak just you know, a little bit on that. Now back to King James. So I had a question from an aqua uh, about a month or two ago. Um, and she asked me on my YouTube comment board um, was King James a mo? All right. And the simple answer to that was no. And so I want to just speak a little bit about why um, that allegation was put upon him, because a lot of people, they take it out of context. They'll go and read it um, and then they'll say that, oh, he had many lovers of, uh, you know, men and this, that and the third. OK, these are all allegations that was brought upon him that started with one man that was kicked out of his um, kingly court based off allegations that King James found in letters that was written by him uh, upon spewing uh, racism back then. And so we're going to go into it, Lord's will. So I got this. Uh, this is from uh, chickpublications.com. And the question is, uh I have been told that King James was a mo. Is this true? All right. And the answer is simply no. Now, to break this down, they just give a brief synopsis as to what actually happened in a lead up to him being called a mo. 
So it says King James I of England, who authorized the translation of the now famous King James Bible, was considered by many to be one of the greatest, if not the greatest, monarchs that England has ever seen. And through his wisdom and determination, he united the warring tribes of Scotland into a unified nation and then joined England and Scotland to form the foundation for, for what is now known as the British Empire. At a time when the churches of England possessed the Bible in English, King James' desire was that the common people should have the Bible in their native tongue. That was another thing because it wasn't a fact that he wanted them to have a copy, which the, the, uh, the only people that was allowed to have the actual Bible was those priests in the church. And so that's, this is the importance why you have to study the history. You have to go back and understand what the society was like back then. What was the rules, the, 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 the uh, laws that was passed, this, that, and the third. So he not only want them to have their own copy, but he thought it was, uh, you know, fit for them to have it within their native tongue. So it says, thus in 1603, King James called 54 of history's most learned men together to accomplish this great task. And at a time when the leaders of the world wished to keep their subjects in spiritual ignorance, that's the key. Notice it says during a time or at a time when the leaders of the world wish to keep their subjects in spiritual ignorance, meaning they didn't want. All right. They didn't want to get to a point where um, people were visiting and looking at the scriptures on their own or whatever. They wanted to keep a grasp over the uh, mass of people. And how do you do that by keeping them? you know, in the darkness and you hold ownership to what's written so that they don't have no copies. That That's what was going on back then. So it says King James offered his subjects the greatest gift that he could uh, give them their own copy of the word of the most high in English. That was the controversy. A lot of people don't understand this. They'll just take what they heard and regurgitate all oh, King James. He was a mole and he wrote the book of demiology and he, he was into witchcraft. They don't even understand, which we're going to get to that too, a little bit later on in this lesson. So it goes on to say, um, James was fluent in Latin, Greek, and French and schooled in Italian, Spanish, and even wrote a tract entitled counterblast, uh, uh, to tobacco, which was written to help thwart the use of tobacco in England. It says such a man was sure to have enemies. One such man, Anthony Weldon. All right. Which this person doesn't get spoken about a lot. Anthony Weldon. All right. Now, before we continue. All right. Let's let's deal with um who he actually was. All right. So let me just do this. Um. Let's go here real quick. Now, it says here, just a little back, you know, introduction on Anthony Weldon. So Sir Anthony Weldon, born between 1583 and passed away 1648. Um, it says to be that he was an English 17th century uh, courtier and politician. And he is also the purported author of the court and character of King James I, Although this attribution has been changed and I wonder why. So you got to be careful because, you know, Esau loves to throw in, you know, little things to try to control the narrative. Now, it says the story of Weldon's dismissal from the king's court for his negative assessment of the Scots in a description of Scotland. Right. Um, it says. Uh, is usually taken as the justification for the criticism of the James in the court in the character of King James the first, which contains the famous comment that James was the wisest fool in the Christendom. However, it is unclear whether Weldon was the author of either of these works and a description of Scotland was first published six years before Weldon's dismissal from the court and was not credited to him until the second half of the 17th century. Likewise, the court in the character of King James the first was not credited to Weldon until after his death in 1648, 
He did, however, support Parliament during the English Civil War, holding and administering the county of Kent. Now, what you have to understand um, was it was said, and I read this a long time ago, but I can't find it. I think they scrapped it off the Internet. But uh, a few years ago, I actually stumbled upon when King James uh, pretty much brought him to trial and they had actually evidence that he was the author of the description of Scotland. And he actually made uh, racist comments to the uh, committee board during that time. That's why he was um, pretty much accused and he was dismissed out of the king's court, which ultimately led to Anthony Weldon after the, uh, King James's death. He was he was the man that was responsible making up false accusations that King James uh, was a moat. But see, a lot of people don't understand that and they'll just take what this uh, alleged, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? What Anthony Weldon basically said, people will just take that and then they'll just regurgitate what they heard and just said, oh, why are you reading a book from a man who was a mole who authorized it? Like, come on, dude, that's the best you got. That's no, that's not the real case, especially a person who, mind you, had passed away and he couldn't even defend himself. And during that time, all the the uh, during that time in society, everybody knew who he was. He had a wife. He had children. He believed wholeheartedly in the scriptures. Why would this person who wholeheartedly believed in the scriptures and tried to have the kingdom set up so much in a way where it reflect what the scriptures tells us to do? But yet he behind closed doors, he was a mo like, come on, man. And this is the and this is the BS that people spew because they don't understand the history. Right. But let's go back to this uh, chick publication. Now, it says dealing with Anthony Weldon. It says one such man, Anthony Weldon, had to be excluded from the court and Weldon swore vengeance. And it was not until 1650, 25 years after the death of James, that Weldon saw his chance. All right. He wrote a paper calling James a mo. And pardon me, Salakia, obviously James being, you know, passed away was in no condition to defend himself. Now, back then, uh, well, it was going to explain itself. It says the report was largely ignored since there were still enough people alive who knew it wasn't true. Because once again, you got to look at the way society was back then. You see, and those people who was actually around him, they knew it wasn't true. But see, people today, they get hell bent or uh, they hear it and then they regurgitate and then they actually don't do their study to see, you know what? Let me see what this is really about. Let me go into this. Let me let me read up on this guy. Let me, you know, look at some of his works that he, you know, contributed to society. And then you make that decision by yourself to see if the things or the allegations that came out pertaining to this individual, whether they were true or not. Simple as that. Right. So let me read this part over again. It says the report was largely ignored since there were still enough people alive who knew it wasn't true. And in fact, it lay dormant for years until recently when it was picked up by Christians, so-called Christians, that is, who hoped that vilifying King James would tarnish the Bible that bears his name so that Christians would turn away from the uh, from the Most High's book to a more modern translation. Did you pick up on that? Let me read that part again. Until recently, when it was picked up by Christians who hoped that vilifying King James, because King James was a Jake, he was an Israelite. All right. He was a so-called dark skinned man. All right. It says who hoped that vilifying King James would tarnish the Bible that bears his name so that Christians would turn away from the Most High's book to a more modern translation. Now, one thing that I want to point out. All right, let me go to my folder here, because remember. 
uh, right after the 17th century, you had what was called the um, the 18th century, which back then was called the uh, the so-called um, Great Awakening. And so, Lucky, I'm just trying to find my photos, history. Aha. Now, let me put this up real quick. Just to just to try to make a point, because I want to show you guys something. All right. So let's go here. Salakia, let's go there. And let me just pull up this photo real quick. Hopefully it comes up. Right. Now, don't worry too much because I'm just going to read it out loud. But I don't know if you can see those men in the background. Now, why is this important? Because the last uh updated version of the King James Bible was 17 matter of fact let me see I got a copy here let me see uh 17 you have 1780 and 1789 and then I have here uh right after 1789 I think it was or 1784 which had all 80 books, anything after the 17th century, they changed it. They took the 14 books out, which today is known as the Apocrypha. And then I have this version, Collins since 1819, which only gives you 66 books. So that's between the Old Testament and the New Testament. Now, what I have here in the background, I'm going to read it out. And this is why it's important, because they used this during the time of the 18th century, which was known as the Great Awakening, which means that they started to infiltrate different sects of the churches and they started to take over corporations and then they started to implement what they wanted the masses of the people to know. So this is a screenshot of what I have. And there was many more men, as you can see, but the top three men, you had Philip Schaff from Switzerland, you have Brooke Westcott from England and you have Fenton J.A. Horton. And what they were responsible was they tried to corrupt the word of the Most High in 1881 by altering the Bible and making revisions to the uh, King James Bible and removing the Apocrypha. That's what they done or what they tried to do. That's the reason why if you try to purchase just a regular King James Bible, you won't ever get a regular King James Bible because the the original regular King James Bible consists of all 80 books. But if you go on Amazon Prime and you try to order yourself the 1611 edition, the starting base price off that book is around $380 and higher. Think about that. It's it's 300 that's just the starting price. It may have gone up since then. But the last time I saw it, the, the lowest price was like 380 bucks for it for a King James Bible. But if you get what they call today in modern terms, a regular King James Bible, that'll cost you anywhere from 15 to 20 bucks, not even less than that. I've seen them cheaper as 10 bucks. And that's not even with the Apocrypha. That's just with the New Testament and the Old Testament. You're still missing 15, uh, 14 books. So what they do is they make you buy the authorized King James uh, Apocrypha, the little red book, which will cost you no more than like 12, between 12 to 15 dollars, not even. Right. So then you had, um, let me see if I can find it, if it's in this folder. Yep, it is. So now let's say now this was the 1800s. OK. This is the 1800s. This was during the time of the Great Awakening. This is when Esau started to try to, you know, take over the narrative, try to change things, as the scripture says, right? Now, let's fast forward and let's go to the 19th 
um, uh, the 1900s or so, dealing with the, um, you know, so-called Illuminati, Freemasonry and stuff and what they tried to do. And I'm going to read this out. Now, this is a real article. All right. And again, I'll read it because I know you can't see it as much, but this is a real article. Now, this is from the NWO uh, insider who pretty much told the plans to corrupt the scriptures. And this goes as far back in 16, uh, sorry, in 1969. All right. So I'm going to read it to show you that everything that we're saying. All right. We have the facts to back it up. We're not just talking out of, uh, out of our behinds, man. OK, we don't do these lessons to just do them. And then we you know, you have certain people, especially on this app, you know, they'll pretend like they're doing a lesson. But majority of the time, they just talk in BS. You're really not learning anything. They're just bringing their opinions on what they think. No, we don't do opinions over here. We deal with facts. OK, now this is a this is an insider from 1969. All right. And his name is uh, Dr. Richard Day. All right. He was born in 1927 and he passed away in 1989. And you can look this up. All right. And I have the article right here. So it says Dr. Richard Day was a professor of pediatrics from the University of Pittsburgh and Mount Sinai Medical School in New York and National Medical Director of Planned Parenthood. OK, what's that uh, lady's name? Is it Margaret Sanger? The one who's... um and control of Planned Parenthood, if I'm not mistaken from wrong, uh, Salakia, you can correct me. So automatically that should ring a bell. That should be a red flag. What? Planned Parenthood, right? Yeah. All right. Now it says, which is funded by the government, the Rockefeller Foundation, since its inception in 1921, and private donors. So already you know what's going on just by me saying those names, those corporations, who is funded by. Okay? Because remember, pertaining to America's Constitution, which was signed in 1774, you had a group of men who deemed themselves as the Illuminati, okay, which really they were your top bankers at that time. And they needed to infiltrate before that treaty was signed in 1774 so that they can actually own the United States of America. But that's a different uh, you know, topic for a different time. So it says here, oops, it says uh, Dr. Lawrence Dunnigan, born 1923, passed away in, uh, in 2004, was practicing pediatrician in Mount Lebanon, Pennsylvania. For over 34 years, the following is quoted from his recollections of a lecture he attended on March 20th, 1969 at a meeting of pediatricians. Right. Think about it. This is what he found in a room full of other pediatricians. Now, listen to what the discussion was about. The transcribed document, all right, so anybody that tries to come in here tell me, you're just making it up. It is a document. You can't make up a legal document. It says the transcribed document uh, titled NWO plans to, you know, make known by insider in 1969, and I'm just trying to word it differently because I don't want them to cut the live. It says, uh, outlines the complete destruction of the world based on the new world system, right? It says this, and I quote, in order to do this, right? So basically they're giving you an outline of what they want to take place in the new world order, this, this global reset. This was back in 1969. And to show you that it's coming to pass, you can look at countries like China and recently Canada that just posted a law that if you're caught teaching the scriptures, okay, 
uh, to a certain degree, however they have it outlined, you can serve as up to five to 10 years in jail. We're in that time right now. Go and search the article. I'm not making this up. Matter of fact, Lord's will, I'll pull up the article after we get done reading this. Because this all ties into King James, the King James Bible. So it says, and I quote, in order to do this, the Bible will be changed. Think about what Yuval Harari, Klaus Schwab's little dominion, stated about using AI technology to rewrite the Bible. They're going to use what they call chat GP or whatever it's called. OK, which gives an automated uh, version to revise what the Bible should be. We are in these times now, but they are telling you as far back as 16. Oh, sorry, I keep saying 16, 1969. So he says, in order to do this, the Bible will be changed. It will be rewritten to fit the new religion. This is the reason why we had to do what? We had to go into that word religion because that word religion has been revised. It is simply today, it, it simply means, or back then, I should say, they used it to try to manipulate and to keep the spiritual ignorance of the people at the palm of their hands, which really, when you go into religion, you break it down, all right? It simply just means to worship Yahweh Bashem Yahweh Shai. It doesn't mean it in the form of what we were taught in this day and age. And that's the that's what people... They're just unlearned because they don't do their research. They don't look up words. But nevertheless, so gradually, key words will be replaced with new words having various shades of meaning. This is why, let's get a precept, having various shades of meaning. So new words will be replaced with the old words, okay, but will give various shades of meaning. So what was written in the law? Let's get Deuteronomy. Okay, and I believe it's uh, chapter four. All right, and I'm gonna get straight to the point. I'm gonna start at verse two. It says, ye shall not add unto the word which I command you, neither shall ye diminish art from it that ye may keep the commandments of Yahweh your power which I command you. All right. That was in the law. And let's go to Revelation 22. That was in the Old Testament. And we're going to have it in the New Testament. Revelation 22. It says. In verse 18, for I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add unto these things, the most high shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, the Most High, Yahweh Bashem Yahushua, shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. In other words, all the prophecies that were written, if you try to add onto it or you try to take away, to take away meaning you shun away from what's written. You don't give the full truth to what's actually written. Okay. You're going to be destroyed. That's why Esau has no, he has no uh, mercy. There's no mercy for him because he not only, uh, you know, he not only stolen our heritage, he not only blasphemed, Yahweh Bashem Yahushah, blasphemed the holy angels, all right, blasphemed the children of Israel because they're calling themselves the people, but he's also tampered with the scriptures. He's taken a lot from the scriptures and then he's added, he's added new denominations new derivatives from the Catholic Church because the word Catholic sim simply just means universal. But when you read the Bible, the Bible is foreign to universalism. That's why people get upset with us when they say, well, when we teach them and tell them that according to the scriptures, God doesn't love everybody. Although he may be the father of all spirits, he has one chosen nation that he's loved. And that he's put his spirit upon, that he's put his name upon, and that he's given them an heritage. And that's very hard for people to accept when they've been brainwashed for so many of years being under those false re so-called religions. Mainly Christianity. 
So let's go back to the article here. I'm going to read that part again. It says keywords will be replaced with new words having various shades of meaning. It says then the meaning attached to the new word can be close to the old word. And as time goes on, other shades of meaning of that word can be emphasized and then gradually that word replaced with another word. This is their plan. That's why Yuval Harari wanted to bring in I, uh, AI uh, chat GP to change the Bible. There was another guy who said the scriptures needs to be re uh, rewritten because it needs to be updated with modern times. Loosely translated, what he was trying to say was, because we have genders and everything in this society, it needs to be updated for that sake. Because it's discriminating against the alphabet community. You see where I'm going with this? So you got to understand, all right, the times that we're in, man. The days are evil, man. And it's only going to get worse from here on out. It's only going to get worse from here on out. So let's continue to read this document, all right, because a lot of people don't know about this document that you see right here. So it goes on to say, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but the idea is that everything in scripture need not be rewritten. So the focal point is they don't want to rewrite everything, right? But just key words replaced by other words, just key words replaced by other words. Give me an example of that because they've done a great job with that. When you jump to the New Testament, you have something that's called the word Gentiles, right? Everybody knows that, right? Here's the problem with that. When you read the Greek Septuagint, you will not find the word Gentile. That word was later added on for universalism. Did you know that? And I have a video of a, a scholar himself who is very well studied in the English language, who goes on to a podcast and he actually breaks it down and tells you that Paul's epistles were not written to other nations known as Gentiles. They were actually written to Israelite foreigners. He already knew this. I got the evidence. I got the video and I've already post, posted it not only on my TikTok, but I've also have it on my YouTube page. This is a top scholar because the argument was when they were translating the Greek Septuagint to certain English words, give an example. In 1 John, the fifth chapter in the seventh verse, where it talks about the Father, the Holy Spirit, and Yahweh Shah, who the world ignorantly calls Jesus Christ, are one and the same. When you actually go into the Greek Septuagint, that's known as the Johannem, um, how do you say it? Let me see. So lock it, bear with me. Let me look it up. It's known as the uh, real quick. Got to bring this out. Let's see here. First John five and seven. The Johanna. It's, it's called Salaki. I mispronounced uh, it. It's actually called the Johannan comma. It's called the Johannan comma, which means when they translate it through the English, they actually added it later on. But when you go into the, the actual Greek Septuagint, you won't find that comma there because they added it later on. So that was that's one example on how they just, you know, slightly put in key parts of a verse to try to change the whole meaning. That's why you have something that's called the Trinity or the Holy Trinity, which people don't understand. The Holy Trinity is a Babylonian doctrine. It goes back to Nimrod, Semiramis, and um, Tammuz. It has nothing to do with the scriptures because the scriptures tells you that the Heavenly Father, Yahweh, his son, Yahweh Shai, and the Rakakwa Dash, the Holy Spirit, when it says they are one, it means that they 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 work in the same mind. They have the same mindset. They're one and the same in terms of how they operate. They You don't just have one that they will be in this manner, but then the other one will follow their own manner. They'll go off course. No. 
they are in one accord with each other. It doesn't mean that they're the same entity. And that's the problem with the Christian church. They believe in the Trinity, believing that who they ignorantly call Jesus is actual God. No, he's not. Now, he is a God. He is a power, but he's not the almighty power. And there are many tons of scriptures, both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, that proves that. So not to digress. I was just giving you an example of that. So let's get back to this. Now, the article goes on. Let's start back here. It says, I don't know if I'm making that clear, but the idea is that everything in scripture need not to be rewritten. Just key words replaced by other words and the variability and meaning attached to any word can be used as a tool to change the entire meaning of scripture. Did you hear what he just said? And guys, we don't do these sit downs and these lies for, for to just do them for likes or for, no. We have a, a duty, a job to do from Yahweh Bashim Yahweh to raise up our people and to show them the truth. Okay, to expose Esau Edom, the devil that he is, man. This is a council committee being taken in 1969 by a group of pediatricians talking about the New World Order and what they want to do with the Bible. Let me read that part again. Maybe it's not clicking because you got some Christians on this comment board and they just dumbfound like, Dude, I don't know about that. This is an actual documentation. Read it again. The variability and meaning attached to any word can be used as a tool to change the entire meaning of scripture. Most people won't know the difference. And this was another one of the times where he said the few who do notice the difference won't be enough to matter. That's their whole belief. But see, the problem is they don't control the narrative because now what they're doing is they see Israel is starting to wake up, starting with the elect. That's why certain brothers channels is being taken down, is being shadow banned, is being blocked. Because we are pushing this truth. We this the Esau is being made bare, as the scripture says in Jeremiah, the 49th chapter. Let's grab that. Let's get Jeremiah 49. And verse 10, it says, but I have made Esau bare. I have uncovered his secret places. He shall not be able to hide himself. His seed is spoiled and his brethren and his neighbors. And he is not. So. Right now, these devils are being brought to the forefront. They are being exposed on all levels. And everybody saw what happened this past week when I tried to go live and tried to go into the banking family, going into facts are facts. And everybody saw the moment when I started aligning that the the that the uh, designers. OK, going as far back uh, to Germany when they made the treat, the, the the deal with Great Britain. Asking Great Britain to get the United States of America involved in World War One. And remember how I showed you guys the linkage from what Benjamin Freeman said in his book. OK, what he said in his book going back to 1954. Right. As opposed to what the video showed you. Which. How can you cut my live when that's an act that that's an actual documentary is true, which means they allow for it to be up in the algorithm. But they cut the live because it was too much truth. Too much truth was being exposed. Here it is, a video that was published a month ago going into the history versus a book that came out in 1954, which I have a, a few. Uh, uh, um, a uh, what do you call it? A, 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 a soft copy. And all we was doing was just comparing what he said in his speech. To a gentleman by the name of Goldstein, who was a, also a small hat. Compared to what the author of the video was saying, man, and they got hurt and they cut my life and I had to go on YouTube. So. <laughs> hey, it's a beautiful time we live in, so. That's where we're at right now. 
They're trying to change the uh, change the scriptures. So this is the reason why. And let me come back over here. They want to do away. With um, King James, they 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 uh, they want to change it and they and they've already done so in the process. You know, they um, let me see here. Trying to find my thing. They uh, they've done so in the process, but the overall goal is they want to um, they they want to do away with all of that, man. That's the that's the overall goal. All right, but yeah, how about Shemal Shah is only going to let them get so far. Now, going back in this letter dealing with King James itself, all right, because we have to get this understanding. So I'm going back here at chickpublications.com dealing with uh, Anthony Weldon. Now, it goes on to say, let me just read this paragraph again. It says the report was largely ignored since there were still enough people alive who knew it wasn't true. And in fact, it lay dormant for years until recently when it was picked up by Christians who hoped that vilifying King James would tarnish the Bible that bears his name so that Christians would turn away from the Most High's book to a more modern translation. Now you understand the lead up to everything. That's why I had to go into those guys in the 1800s trying to remove the Bible within itself, but they couldn't do that. So what they did was they took out the 14 books. And then I had to go into that document, okay, that was recorded from a meeting by the pediatricians in 1969. Okay, so nobody can dispute what I'm saying because I've given the facts. Right, you need to do your due diligence and go and study and look the things up that I brought out. So it goes and say, it seems though that Weldon's false account is being once again largely ignored by the majority of Christianity with the exception of those with their ulterior motives such as its author had. And that's what it is today. You even got jakes that are claiming to be in the truth or whatever, all right, that, um, and I don't know how that works, but here it is, they claim it to be an Israelite, but then they go against King James uh, writings. Like I had a brother that came after me and saying, you know, what scriptures you reading from, what book you reading from? We go from the 1611 King James Bible. That's a false book. You're reading from a, a, a man who was found with many male lovers and he's a mole. That's what he said to us. Showing you he doesn't even understand that accusation and where it actually uh, stemmed from. Right? Now it says here, it might also be mentioned here that the Roman Catholic Church was so desperate to keep the true Bible out of the hands of the English people that it attempted to uh, I'll just say assassinate King James and all of Parliament in 1605. And when you go into that history, uh, for what I remember when I read up on it, that was really the case because they wanted to keep the, the people, all right, in gross darkness in terms of keeping their spiritual intelligence to a bare minimum. And they didn't want them to have full copies of the Bible. So what does that lead to? That leads to them having to physically come into the churches and whatever questions they had, they will go to the actual priest and he will open up the scrolls or the books and he will give his interpretation on what they want. Now, this is where you get into different doctrines like the hell doctrine. If you don't obey the word of God, you're going to burn in all eternal hellfire. No, that's not what that's talking about. All right. Goes on to say, in 1605, Roman Catholic by the name of Guy Fawkes, under the direction of a Jesuit priest uh, by the name of Henry Garnet, was found in the basement of Parliament with 36 barrels of gunpowder, which he was to use to blow up uh, King James and the entire Parliament. After uh, eliminating the king, they planned on imprisoning his children, reestablishing England as a state loyal to the Pope and to unalive all who resisted. Needless to say, the perfect English Bible would have been one of the plot's victims. Fox and Garnet and eight other conspirators were caught and hanged. And it seems that those who worked so hard to discredit the character of King James joined an unholy lot. And that's what, it, pardon me, that's what it was. So really, uh, it was Anthony Weldon that started it, but then there was another guy who 
after, uh, for what I can remember, af after Anthony Weldon passed away, there was another guy named, uh, it was either James or John or something to that effect. What he did was he took the works of a Anthony Weldon and then he added to it, to the to the uh, conspiracy that King James in, in, indeed was a mo. And that's entirely not true. He was not a mo. So you, you can go and look the rest. Of, now, the last thing I want to cover in this uh, is... Uh, what's this dealing with the um, the book of demon uh, demonology because that's another thing okay well why did he if he was a man of the most high why did he write a whole book called demonology dealing with witchcraft and everything else like that well if you actually looked at his letters that he sent to his son his eldest son you will understand why he wrote it so let's just give a little bit of a background King James I of England wrote a book titled Demonology in 1597. This is before he authorized the King James 1611 Bible. The primary purpose, listen closely, the primary purpose of this book was to address the topic of witchcraft and the existence of witches and demons. Because when you go back around that time, all right, you had a lot of enchantments. You had a lot of, of Wiccan. You had a lot of witchcraft that was going on. All right. And in a, in a, uh, especially going even uh, back during the time of the Byzantine Empire. It says. King James was deeply interested in the subject and believed that witchcraft posed a significant threat to society. Did you hear that? He wrote it and was interested in it because he knew that it posed an intricate threat to society because he wholeheartedly believed in the scriptures. It goes on to say, um, it says, demonology was written as a uh, treatise to guide judges and officials in the, uh, pros uh, the prosecution of witches, offering explanations of how to identify witches in the methods for dealing with them. Did you hear that? Let me read that sentence again. Maybe it didn't stick to you. Demonology was written as a treaty to guide judges and officials in the prosecution of witches, offering explanations of how to identify witches and the methods for dealing with them. Let's get a precept. Exodus chapter 22 and verse 18, which is in the law. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That's written in the law. Here it is. You had a man that that tried to rule the society predicated on the law, statutes and commandments to the best of his ability. Obviously, he has some opposition, which his main opposition was the church. You see that? So he wrote the book to help those people to determine based off what he wrote off his findings on how to determine if somebody's a witch, warlock, whatever the case may be, and how to actually deal with them. It goes on to say it reflected the prevailing beliefs and fears about witchcraft during that time period and contributed to the witch hunts and the trials that occurred in Europe and North America in the 16th and 17th centuries. You see that? But why are you reading from a book of a man who was a mo and he wrote the book about witchcraft? He was into witchcraft and enchantments. Don't even understand why he wrote the book. This is why you brothers and sisters need to stop listening to people just regurgitate things that they heard without doing your research. Here's another thing. King James the Sixth of Scotland, later known as King James the First of England, wrote a book on demonology called Demonology in 1597. All right. Slack you. Let me read that again. King James the Sixth of Scotland, later known as King James the First of England, wrote a book of demonology called Demonology in 1597. 
The purpose of the book was to provide a theological and philosophical justification for the persecution of witches. So the next time somebody tries to come at you and say, but he wrote a book of demonology, he was into witchcraft and witches. No, he wasn't into it the way that you think he was. He written it to pose justification for persecuting anybody that took part of such practices because he was hardly against it, or I should say he was wholeheartedly against such practices. Right? So it goes on to say, King James was personally interested in witchcraft and believed that it posed a serious threat to society. That's the reason. That's one of the main reasons I believe, and I'm speaking as a man, why they got upset, why they uh, actually got upset at him and they actually tried to assassinate him. They was trying to throw all of these accusations on him because he was actually doing what people would deem as the greater good for society to a certain extent that is right. But it goes on to say, um, demonology was intended to serve as a guide for identifying and persecuting witches. And it reflected the widespread fear and persecution of individuals accused of witchcraft during that time period. Do you see what's going on here? I mean, what else can we say, man? So let me see if there's anything else I want. Um, let me go over here. Now, check this out. This is from Demonology Wikipedia. Um, it says James says that demons. Now, this is this is um, King James statement. Listen to what he stated. King James says that demons are under the direct supervision of the most high and are able or Salakia and are unable to act without God's permission. Where do you think he got that from? What scripture should come to mind? Let me read it again and then we're going to get the precept. King James says that demons are under the direct supervision of the most high and are unable to to act without the Most High's permission. And he shows how the Most High uses demonic forces as a rod of correction. Uh-oh. When men stray from his will, demons may also be commissioned by witches or magicians to conduct acts of ill will against others. Showing you that basically what King James is saying, uh, and this is a two-part uh, scenario here, but on the one hand, he's stating that Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai controls both good and evil, which is true. That's the reason why Yahweh has many titles. Mainly, he is known as the King of Terrors, and he is also known as God Almighty, which means terrible demon like power, demonic. Right? And the water, brother uh, Shaman, uh, Shamar uh, Naya, the water, because we're going to get that precept. But there's, there's another precept that backs up the precept you brought out. So let's read the brother's precept real quick first to show you where King James got this from. Okay, Ecclesiasticus chapter 39 in the Apocrypha, which is what they tried to take out. And we're going to start at verse 28. And it reads, there be spirits that are created for vengeance, which in, the fury, uh, which in their fury lay on sore strokes in the time of destruction they pour out their force and appease the wrath of him that made them. Fire, hell, famine, death, and all of these were created for vengeance. Key part is they were created. Oh, not my God. I love the God I love and serve. He loves everybody. God is all love. You didn't, maybe you didn't, you, you misread the scriptures. Scriptures just told you that they appease the wrath of him. Who is the him in the context? The heavenly father, Yahweh through his only begotten son, Yahweh Shai. It says they appease the wrath of him that made them. He made them. Right? It says teeth of wild beasts, scorpions, serpents, and the sword punishing the wicked to destruction. They, meaning these spirits, 
okay, whether it be good angels or evil angels, demonic angels, shall rejoice in his commandment and they shall be ready upon earth when need is and when their time has come, they shall not transgress his word. Go back and read what King James said. Let's tie it all in. King James says that demons are under the direct supervision of the Most High and are unable to act without the Most High's permission. You know what that also states to you Christians? That means that Satan is also under the authority of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai. And the proof of that is in the book of Job chapters one and two. You see how everything comes back in full swing. This is King James. This is his statement. This is what he stated. Right? Let's get the other precept and we'll close it out. Because this lesson didn't have to be that long. But uh, let's get Psalms. Let me type this in. Um, let's see here. Evil. Let's get this real quick. Right. This is Psalms chapter 78 and verse 49. And it reads, He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, speaking of the Heavenly Father, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending evil angels among them. Evil angels among them. Because the Heavenly Father through His Son, Yahweh Shai, they control both good and evil. That's what you call a righteous balance. But you have people that are unlearned out there where they like to bring in things like Satan fell from uh, fell from head and he was kicked out. No, he wasn't. Satan is a son of the most high on the left hand side. He's in complete order. All the Allahayim are in complete order up in the spiritual realm. You have um, righteous angels on the right hand side and you have evil angels or wicked angels on the left hand side. And guess what? At the end of the day, they all do the bidding of Yahweh Shai. Let's get another precept. Um, how does it go? Right. This is uh, Luke chapter 10. Right. <laughs> Verse 17, it says, and the 70 returned again with joy, saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. The devils are subject unto us through thy name. Why would they be subject? Because remember. Uh, the, 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 when it comes to the angels or even the wicked angels, they even fear and tremble. Let me see if I can find that precept. be able let me see here let me find it uh let me see if i can find it i think it's in james 2 salakia and uh let's see here Yep. James chapter two, verse 19, straight to the point, it says, thou believest that there is one power. Thou doest well. The devils also believe and tremble. See that? The devils also believe and tremble. There it is, man. Let's bring out the uh, precept from the brother Kazak, Ezekiel 14 and nine. That's another beautiful precept. It says, Make sure I got that right. Yep. Ezekiel 14 and 9. It says, And if the prophet be deceived when he has spoken a thing, I, Yahweh, have deceived that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand upon him and will destroy him from the midst of my people Israel. Right. Because you have false prophets within the nation of Israel that's telling you things like John the Baptist wasn't in the truth and he fell out the truth. Um, that um the Heavenly Father 
Oh, you you also have brothers out there, or I'm gonna be calling them a brother, but you got individuals out there that claim that the miracles that Yahweh Shai done was witchcraft. Oh yeah. And they're claiming to be Israel. You got dudes out there that are claiming that Yahweh Shai done witchcraft. Um you have this thing where they don't even believe in the New Testament, but they believe that all Israel is of a dark skin uh, complexion. All right. So anybody else who don't anybody outside of not looking like uh, your Wesley Snipes or whatever, is not an Israelite. But yet that's contradicted because the Hamites are are um, just as dark. So what does that mean that they're Israelites when the scriptures tells you that I will put a difference between you and the Egyptians? When the scriptures, when the biblical uh, compact Bible dictionary, the Zonovan to be exact. Also, the Young's Bible tells you that the son of Ham, which is one of the three sons of Noah, where it states in the definition that Ham was the progenitor of all the dark races, but not the Negroes, but of the Egyptians, the Libyans, the Canaanites, and so forth. So, you know, that's why you have to, and the water, that's a beautiful precept because you, unfortunately, you have these uh, idiots that are within the nation of our people, all right, that are teaching contrary to what the sound doctrine teaches us, right? But once again, if you understand, that's needed for this ministry because that that allows for Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shai to put a separation between those who are actually his that are going to get the understanding of the truth versus the ones that are not his, the ones that he doesn't want. They're going to fall victim to those other doctrines made by men. That's a righteous balance. That's why the scripture says in Romans, the 11th chapter, OK, all Israel have not obtained that which he seeking for, but the election have obtained it and the rest were blinded. So the ones whom Yahweh Bashim Yahweh Shah doesn't want on this side, they're going to take part in those other doctrines that does not subscribe to what the Bible is actually talking about. You have Israelites that just they just woken up to the fact that they are Israelite. That's it. They don't really go into the uh, prophecies. They don't care about that. They just want to look good in a little um, T-shirt wearing fringes. Right. Showing up at uh, holy convocational uh, type of uh, feast festivals. OK, when the scriptures tells you in Ecclesiastes that it is better to join a house of mourning than a house of feasting. You got people, you got our people, they so worried about, uh, uh, you know, living it up on this time or whatever, so much so that they already think that they're in the kingdom. All right, let's get this uh, precept for the brother, Isaiah 29 and 10. It says, for Yahweh have poured out upon you the spirit of deep sleep and have closed your eyes, the prophets and your rulers, the seers have he covered. All right, and a seer back then, all right, was another word for a prophet because the prophets they were the uh, they were over the king. The prophets were more important than the king who was ruling the, uh, the kingdom. So anytime the, the prophets used to come around, the kings, they used to they used to tremble. Because they knew every word that came out of that prophet's mouth was uh, surely going to come to pass, especially if it was a true man of the Lord. All right. Think about the story of uh, Bel uh, Belshazzar. During the Babylonian kingdom, when he got the writing on the wall, many, many, tekel, tekel. And none of his wise men, none of his wise men could break the uh, passage down. But who did he call to come into the room? Daniel. And when Daniel uh, translated it to what it meant. All right. In his um, in his language, basically, it was just that you've been found waved in the balance. Your kingdom is going to be, uh, be brought to an end swiftly. Right. That's why the scripture says, let's uh, get Jeremiah, the 28th chapter and verse eight, the prophets that have been before me and before thee of old prophesy both against many countries and against great kingdoms of war and of evil and of pestilence that happened back then. How much more today? The prophets are back here again today. The true men of Yahweh Bashim Yahweh they are back here again today, prophesying the downfall of Babylon the Great, which is America and its whole beast system. So, you know, I'm going to end it off on there. And before I do, did anybody have any questions on the comment board?
All right. It could be pertaining to the topic that we spoke about or it can be something um, off topic on there. It could be another question dealing with the scriptures, whatever the case may be. Feel free to ask. I got about extra five minutes. Um, but that's pretty much the lesson, man. I just wanted to speak on uh, King James and just to clear up the nonsense of all the accusations that is coming up against him saying that he was a mole and that, um, you know, he practiced witchcraft, necromancy because he wrote a book called Demonology back in the 1500s. Makes no sense. Right. But uh, does anybody have any questions? Let me see here. if we don't have no questions um we can just close out and i'll and i'll post this uh lesson on um on the youtube page uh so you brothers and you sincere sisters that are learning uh can go back and um watch it if you missed the first half of it i'll definitely do that but uh if we're all good and we have no questions um i'll get ready to close out so I want to give all praise, glory, and honor be to Yahweh, Bahashem, Yahweh Shai, Bahashem, Rakak, Wadash, and double honors to our beloved elder apostles of GMS, better known as Great Millstone, who rule well, who also taught us this 144% truth, peace, and salutations unto the hopeful elect, the tabernacle of David, beginning with 144,000, and the rest of the men, women, and children whom Yahweh Bashmel shall have mercy upon. I'm your brother, Matizabath. And Lord's will, this lesson was edifying. It's on to the next. Lord's will, Shalom. Thou shalt not be joined with them in burial, because thou hast destroyed thy land and slain thy people. The seed of evildoers shall never be renowned. Prepare slaughter for his children for the iniquity of their fathers, that they do not rise, nor possess the land, nor fill the face of the world with cities.